Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, we are going to talk about whatever comes to mind. Um, so I wanted to do a philosophy video before I go back to university. Now, it's a hard decision on what to talk about with regards to philosophy, psychology today, because there's a few different things I want to touch upon since I've been kind of within them, invested within them over the past few weeks, over the past few months. Now, specifically, I want to talk about this idea of individuation in Jungian psychology. I want to talk about uh, alchemy a little bit, and I want to also talk about um, active imagination. And I know I've covered a few of these things before, but they're things that are so ever-changing and so seminal and so tricky, 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 tricky things to grasp. Not intellectually or anything like that. It doesn't matter about grasping the concepts intellectually. Active imagination, um... Okay, yeah, alchemy, there's a lot more to that, and there's a lot more to it than I've looked into at the moment. Um, but nonetheless, experientially, there is so much more to these things than intellectually or conceptually. So things like active imagination, and this is kind of synonymous with... The ideas in The Secret of the Golden Flower, which is a alchemical text, it was kind of commented on by Richard Wilhelm and Carl Jung in, I want to say 1929, they, they uh, published that. So, um, in the process of uh, the kind of formulation of the Golden Flower, the kind of interiorization process, which is where you're withdrawing all your psychological projections from the world, you're interiorizing those images into uh, yourself and formulating a... In, you're formulating in the collective unconscious a imagistic representation of your own personality that is essentially the psychological counterpart to the Philosopher's Stone in a way. Um, and... What that does is that creates an individuated individual who cannot be pierced by the images of the outer world or the images of objects and people in the outer world. And then that particular imagistic formulation in the unconscious, which obviously is uh, displayed physically by the anatomy and the... the um, processes of the brain and all the rest of it that formulate our speech and our personality, um, that, in the Taoist perspective of the gold, secret of the golden flower, is the thing that remains after death in the collective unconscious as a, what could we say, an individualized archetypal psychic structure. And that's how an individual can, quote-unquote, because it is a quote-unquote thing, survive death. And um, so this formulation, which comes about through active imagination and comes about through interaction with the world as well and outer journey, um, is ridiculously hard. Now, it has nothing to do with... No, it has something to do with, but it doesn't rely upon any sort of idea of you being what is traditionally known in Buddhism as a stone Buddha. Someone who's kind of well into meditation like this, you know, not saying anything, not doing anything. It doesn't have um, a relation to that. Now, where I currently sit in my act of imagination, I'm in a little bit of a well, we could say a bind at the moment, or we could say a um, a problem. Uh, it's almost as if it's an experiential koan for me, in a sense. Um, and there's been a little bit of what Jung calls the transcendent function coming into me when I've had dialogues between myself and the unconscious, and 
being able to gain from the synthesis of that dialogue a new understanding of a particular part of my personality from, of course, having this dialogue with, with other figures in the person uh, in the uh, psyche, I've been able to get this partially unconscious, partially conscious wave of experience that's come through my personality to lead me forward out of this bind. The problem I have is that I'm coming upon, uh, I've just reached, it, it, if we're talking in the secret of the golden flower, in that alchemical text, the fourth meditation stage. I've, I've been in that for six months now. And that's the stage where the psyche splits. Um, Crane felt, and I might be getting that slightly wrong with pronunciation. Um, I think it's Wolfgang Crane felt is his first name, but I'd have to double check on, on uh, Google. But uh, he says in his book, uh, secret ways of the mind um that essentially this fourth meditation stage in the secret of the golden flower is where the personality of a psyche splits into numerous different sort of it right it's very very hard to explain it could be conceptualized as sub personalities it kind of is that but it kind of isn't that it's actually what the, the real process of it is that within your psyche, and this is a conscious part of meditation rather than an unconscious, although I could see how partially it can be unconscious as well. But it's a con more conscious part of meditation. And when I say meditation, I don't mean sitting down thinking about nothing. I mean extent an extended period of time of contemplation. That's what I'm talking about when I when I talk about meditation in this context. An extended period of time, months upon months, years upon years, of co directed contemplation. Observing your thoughts, observing your feelings, observing everything within you, and observing everything within your psyche. And that has fluctuations, and that has... Uh, different things come through, and different you can observe different things, and... and different states of mind in yourself and all these ups and downs and everything and um so what essentially happens in this kind of fourth meditation stage of the the secret of golden flower is that the psyche bestows and you bestow as well consciously or you you interact with this very very much consciously um a fragmentation of a personality that is uh that can be conceptually derived but that can be experienced uh as fragmentary so it's very 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 hard to explain but essentially you can observe what jung would call archetypes within your personality as fragmented um not sub personalities. I don't want to. I, I'm really reluctant to use that word. Not sub personalities, but kind of certain branches of experience that come through your words and that are a part of your entire personality as it is anyway. So it's kind of like an inspection of your personality and a breaking down of the parts of it consciously on your part. And yes, there is an autonomous element there, which is archetypal, of course, but it's not necessarily the, fa the psyche fragments, because to fragment the psyche, like really fragment it in a more psychotic way, uh, would be more that one part of your ego isn't aware that another part of your ego is, fun another kind of sub-personality is functioning within your ego, with, that's to say within your consciousness. That's not what happens. You have full conscious aware awareness of all of these things. So it's not necessarily a psychotic split in the personality or a, uh, a schizophrenic split in the personality or anything like that. It's more of a conscious process. Um, and, and that's... Uh, that's a hard thing and and I'm slowly now slowly starting to come out of that and it's very 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 hard because what happens to you in such a process is that 
your mind is stretched between not being yourself anymore, but being all of these different things that make up yourself, right? So you say, well, so that's why I labeled my person and I called them personality perceptions and I labeled them and I documented all the different ways in which um, these things are are present within me and and what words they uh, normally formulate and what, how they sort of move in my consciousness in a sense and how they move within my language and how I feel and that's a big part of it how I feel within these different things so that's why I labeled them and I labeled them very very concisely and I made sure that every single word every single experience was accounted for so then I could understand every part uh, every shall we say sub basis of my entire personality so you've got my entire personality there with all the words that I ever use as well because all of my words are associated with my one personality so all of that is like my basis of my personality and my experience and then you've got the sub basis down here which are like fragmented parts shall we say or uh, these kind of personality perceptions these kind of things that make up the entire personality so I was very careful to label these intricately and I was very analytical with understanding when this, what this actually is, what this part of my personality is and where it comes through, how it comes through, what its nature is, what it is within me, what words it uses and I did this for seven different personalities or per, well, personality perceptions and then... Um, was able to understand that every single word I speak is one of these. And it, there's nothing else in my personality but that. Um, so that's where I got the seven, which are Corifni, Antalya, Bonnie, Mabel, uh, Zarino, Ads and Bads. And they're, they're the seven. Uh, and they, those seven, in my experience, and their associated characters, shall we say, make up all of the words I could possibly utilise talking to you right now and uh, between them make up the personality called Adam and that Adam is a a very dynamic fluctuating whole between bleeds in these personality perceptions so right now I would say I'm mainly in Corifni but actually I'm not in Corifni I'm a little bit Corifni I'm a little bit this, I'm a little bit... So, I'm a little bit of a few of them at any one time. I'm not just one, you know, one thing. Now, the problem of this, of course, is that, well, hang on, I don't know where I am. I've got all these different things going on in this meditation stage, in this understanding, in this intellectual understanding as well, because that's what it is. It's an intellectual understanding as much as it is a, a meditative or spiritual exercise. So, where where the hell are you? Because you've... You've taken a look, an intricate look at your personality and gone under this, you know, normal, you could almost say it's a persona, shall we say, it's this persona of just being this one personality. And uh, so, hang on, where is that one personality? Because I can see all these things. So this is a problem, you know, you can see. Now, in The Secret of Golden Flower, it says, uh, no, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which I uh, am quoting from Wilhelm's book. I, I point it up there because it's up there on the shelf. The Secret, way, Secret Ways of the Mind. It says that uh, the dead man... Now, I don't know particularly why the it's called the dead man. Now, I'm assuming that because in early spiritual awakening, in the early stage of the process, you realise that, of course, you are a connected part of the universe, you are, in the in the old sense of the word, God, as Alan Watts would say, and you realise that by understanding that the name that you were given at birth by your parents is a total lie, total fallacy, total concept. It's not, doesn't, it's not you. So, for example, I'll prove this to you very, very simple with with just philosopher's logic. You, well, not even it's not even logic; it's just literally a, 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 a what it is. Um, so, when before you were born, your mum and dad think, uh, "Oh, I wonder what we should call our child." 
uh, Adam, John, Barry. Then we think, right, we'll call him Barry, right? Okay, f- for argument's sake. We'll call him Barry. So then, you know, the child gets born. No one knows who that child is, what their name is or anything. Nothing. It just come out of... The, the child just comes out of the mysteries of the womb. And that's kind of a very Jungian phrase because I'm sure Jung uses that phrase somewhere in one of the collected works. And uh, so he comes out of the mysteries of the womb. And he, you know, no one... He's not Barry. He's not Barry. But anyway, so then what happens is the formal p- procedure of birth certificate, Barry, da di da Barry Robinson or whatever. But that's nothing. That piece of paper means nothing. We don't know that that person's called Barry. He he isn't called Barry. He's just a random mystery to himself. We are all infinite mysteries to ourselves. There's a famous quote that goes something like that from, I think, some sort of poet or something. I've heard it somewhere before. Uh, Although saying that, equally so, it could be from Doctor Who. I don't know. Um... But yeah, so we are. We are all those kind of mysteries to ourselves. So that's why I think it's called The Dead Man in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Because you see, when we've removed the concept of ourselves in that early part of spiritual awakening, and we have to continue on our journey from that, of course, and we don't want to get ego inflation or delusion or anything, which I clearly got ego ego inflation after my first spiritual awakening. Jesus, it was like, yes, oh my God, this is incredible. And you know, for six months or so, I was deluded in a transfixed state of love delusion uh, towards the self or towards the universe of like, oh, yeah, this is brilliant. Anyway, but, you you know, um, you know, hopefully you don't get any of that sort of stuff. But when you have that first spiritual awakening, you realize that you are no one. You are literally nothing. Um, and so that's why I think it's called the dead man, because y- you're dead. You see, you're dead to yourself. You don't you don't know yourself anymore. So I think, I, I don't know, it's just a hypothesis of mine. I, w- I would say that that's the most likely hypothesis of why it's called The Dead Man in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But I've not read The Tibetan Book of the Dead. I'm merely quoting it out of another book, so I'd have to read it. Anyway, so he says, uh, he quotes him in Secret Ways of the Mind, that the dead man has to be careful not to invest the divine light into these kind of figures. And I think... Going off the basis of that book and the way he was talking about it, these figures that we're talking about are also the same as the figures that break away from the man in meditation in The uh, Secret of the Golden Flower. Very, very easy link to make. Um, And so you've got to be careful not to just kind of think that you're one of these figures. Like, for example, I say, well, uh, I I start to get unconscious of the fact that I'm more being like Corifni. Now, Corifni is characterized by the philosophical side of my nature. And he, he's very kind of... Normally, what I portray on a philosophy video, which just quite naturally, because it's an instinct. It's the instinct for intelligence uh, as kind of associated with the wise old man archetype. And that has uh, an impact on through my personality so if you become too unconscious of the fact that you're being more of that then you're straying from this whole personality and if you stray from that whole personality you invest uh, this kind of light of individuation we could say as well this this light of understanding your whole personality into that one figure uh, that that was one of the figures that split off in the meditation stages. So if you do that, you're gone. You can't realize a whole personality because you see you've been you, you've invested into that one figure, not into yourself as who you are fully. But again, it's very hard to understand who you are fully when you've had this split of these things come through you. So. The task of the individual, it seems, and I'm not through these stages yet, so I can't understand, is to try to cultivate this imagistic representation of the whole personality that you are essentially directed towards and that you always were from the beginning, as Jung would say, and then interiorize that go inside yourself and 
reverence that, hold to that, and obviously be aware of your projections in the outer world as well and withdraw as many of those as you can. Uh, And then I would assume what happens over a very, very lengthy time period, and I don't think I'm going to get there till probably my 50s, um, is that all of these personality perceptions, as I've called them, um, uh, just by way of my analysis of myself and introspection of myself, um, they come together to form uh, a whole personality, a whole representation of your personality that has an imagistic representation in the unconscious, as I mentioned, and that is a correct synthesis of all of the different you know, for me, seven, as I've distinguished them, but for however many other people distinguish, in the book of, uh, in the secret uh, of Golden Flower, there's there's five little men. And then off the five little men, there's five other little men. So there's 25 little men. And the the reason that in, in that text and in that image, there's five little men and then five other men is because it's the same with my personality perceptions. Within let's say, Criffney, or within ads, or within any of the personality perceptions I have, there is other kind of attitudes and characters implicit within those. So I can very much see why that's been drawn in that way in in The Secret of the Golden Flower. And uh, so, yeah, it's something like that. You have to synthesize. Then what you can do, of course, is you can become um, a cyclical reality after death, which is to say that your image, your individual image and uh, of your anatomy and your personality become a guiding force in the collective unconscious for people of the next generation. That's to say that they will see you in your in their dreams and you will be a whole personality still, not a fragmented person who just ends up falling off a chart and and, 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 and doesn't, let's say, survive the trip after death. Um, and what that is uh, synonymous with, because I can give you a very obvious example, right? And then you'll be like, oh my God, Adam, yeah, this is actually, there's some basis in this. So Socrates, we all know Socrates. When I say the word Socrates to you, you have a collective image of Socrates. That's to say probably some sort of bearded man in a white, sort of a white toga or something like that. It's very, the image for us all is going to be very, very similar. Not not different by much. Because Socrates, over the hundreds of years, has become a collective part of the unconscious. Not a personal part of the unconscious, you see. He represents solidly a collective image of the wise old man, of the great old sage, because he has become, and he comes to people in dreams as well, people will have dreams of him, and and he's still there to, to a degree in the collective unconscious, now of course I'm not claiming that that is Socrates, Socrates has died of course, but I'm saying that his personality has kind of become like a forced ghost in Star Wars, that, in fact, the idea in Star Wars of the Force Ghost, George Lucas was, of course, writing it, has actually come from a fantasy of an archetypal experience of the Force Ghost in the collective unconscious through into the the, the realm of, of story and mythology in, in start, the, the mythological realm of Star Wars, which is actually quite amazing in itself. Um so what you are rep- what you are witnessing when you are witnessing, for example, in Star Wars: The Clone Wars, in the end of ep- end of season six, when Yoda has to go to this far off weird planet um, and become a, a Force ghost, uh, he has to go through the stages. In fact, the um, episode called Destiny is a perfect representation of the individuation process. It's uh, but actually, what Yoda's going through, because you see, Yoda's already a uh, Jedi Master, which essentially is a Taoist Master, because Yoda is based on the Taoists, really. Uh, you know, you could say a bit of a Buddhist as well, but it's very Taoist, Star Wars. It's not as it's not as Buddhist, it's more Taoist. Um, anyway, so um, Yoda is already a Master. So actually, it's not the process of individuation per se, 
it's more of a a, a supra process of individuation because he's already gone through the process of individuation but what he's now got to go through is an extra process sort of a, a supra p- a hero's journey in a sense uh, that then gets him to the the total stage of what some would call after death uh, supreme perfect enlightenment which is the idea of the inter- interiorization in the secret of the golden flower which is where you can have a psychic reality after death and influence the thoughts and behavior of the living people on the planet at that time which is exactly what a force ghost does as well um so he goes through and he has to battle his own shadow and that is a perfect representation in that episode of battling your own well battling the collective shadow well it's Yoda's personal shadow bleeding into the collective shadow. It's both. And he has to battle that. Then he has to battle his anima. But he has to battle his anima in a specific way. It's not in a feminine form, but it's the anima as associated with the emotional investment in ideas and experiences. Now, of course, the feminine side of the anima in that episode is represented is represented by that kind of meant to be good Jedi girl who's there, but she's a bit kind of bad at the same time. You get this ominous feeling from her, and that's representing this kind of ominous side of the feminine. And uh, and and of course, he goes over. In fact, another representation of the feminine is Ahsoka. He goes over to Ahsoka, and he's in the Jedi Temple, and uh, this illusion that's been set around him, this fantasy illusion is where basically they've all been killed and he can't contain his grief and his anger and all the rest of it and that's the anima that's the negative side of his anima and he has to overcome that then he has to overcome his serenity as well because again that's the side of the anima that that he has to overcome and uh, uh, you see that kind of level of, of desire in bliss now this is analogous if not synonymous with the idea of the Pratyeka Buddha in Buddhism where you can get knowledge of let's say enlightenment or anything like that of serenity and you can just wander off and not be involved in the fetters of the world now now he has to overcome that as well and yeah and and there's not only that in there there's loads of different fit parallels you could draw with that particular scene um and then, of course, he, he he goes off and he has to try and get... He still has some meditation and things to do surrounding being able to become a force ghost. But that's essentially what it is. It, and that is real. The force ghost is a real reality. Now, when I say Socrates, okay, we say Socrates is a force ghost or he's, a, he's, a, a, he's got a cyclical reality... Uh, he's he's kind of in a in a state of living death in a in a way we could say. Uh, now these ideas uh, they also come into the Egyptian conception of the soul, and um, there's this idea that uh, in Egyptian um, religion mythology that uh, is exactly the same as the Taoist idea and the secret of golden flower. And most likely is very, very similar to the ideas in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, and in this idea of the Egyptian uh, conception of the soul, the the personality and the vital essence, that's uh, Bay and K, I'm, I'm probably pronouncing them slightly wrong, but it's K-A and B-A, um, combine, can, can we combine and reanimate after death? Now, the K, the enlivening spirit, is the same as the spirit in uh, in Christianity. It's the same as certain things in the golden flower as well. And it's the same as the animus in Jungian psychology. And the Be is the, or the Ba, is the um, same as the anima. And it's the same as the idea. Um, and it's the same as... Uh, again, certain other thing, very, very similar aligning things in the secret of the golden flower. These conceptions run throughout history, run throughout many, many, many different religions and mythologies. Oh, that's the other thing as well. It's the same as the soul in Christianity. It's also the same as the soul in alchemy. So Satan, this over here, uh, the animus is the same as the 
the the spirit in alchemy as well and things or, or well actually to give it more of a proper reference the spirit is the sulfur in alchemy and and the the soul is the the, the mercury in alchemy and you know all of it so we all tie in together like like crazy and uh, so there's these ideas in egyptian uh, religion and mythology as well um and so and i mean you've got similar ideas like you know spirits the idea of the spirit in christianity not the spirit as in the the spirit the natural spirit in all of us um uh, but spirits as in like you know dead spirits and stuff that's the same it's the same thing as what i'm explaining so anyway socrates is in the collective unconscious da 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 now it says in the secret of golden flower and it also says in the egyptian conception of the soul that these kind of ideas these kind of these personalities shall we say or these living partially living personalities in the collective unconscious can uh, make both good and bad things happen to people now what does that mean in normal language because um, we'll keep it quite normal here so what this means is that uh, when you have an idea of philosophy when you're a philosopher and you're writing your philosophy books you have an image in your mind of a great philosopher especially when you're a young philosopher because you're looking up to these great philosophers and they're idols for you and what happens with that idol is it is it has an imagistic representation in in your semi-conscious so when you're writing about all these old philosophers let's just for argument's sake say you're writing about socrates socrates the image of socrates that collective image resides in your mind and it actually has an effect on you that image and you won't really unless you've got a superior psychology realize that that image is having an impact on you you won't for the most part and um and so you'll be writing and you might think to yourself oh, you know, maybe I I could have said that in a better way or maybe I might have said that in in this way or that way. And normally what you'll find at the same time is that that collective image has become a a ruler for you, an an animus figure for you, uh, which is to say that it's actually affected your judgment. And it's because of that idol that you've thought, oh, actually, no, I'll say this in a different way because, you see, it's the animus that's ruling over you at that time and and it's that particular figure as well it's a representation of that but nonetheless it's also uh, a formulation of socrates because you have in your semi-conscious the idea of socrates and the idea is synonymous with the personality because of course the idea of myself is my personality you can only formulate the personality in the context of ideas. The personality is an idea. Uh, without an idea, there isn't a personality. It isn't there. You have to know an idea. You have to be conscious of an idea. I can only speak with ideas, and those ideas create my personality. And that is synonymous within Schopenhauer's philosophy of, of the will and the idea. So, for example, uh, I, of course, have a will. And, of course, I have ideas in my mind. And whenever I want to do anything, I have to combine the will and the idea. That is to say, through my vocal tract right now, I've, I've got a will. I've got a conscious will. And I'm choosing to produce things out of my vocal tract. That's, that's a will. And I have to, to... But to do that, I have to have the idea to do that, you see. So... The formula, that's the yin and the yang, you see. The idea is the yin, the, the will is the yang. And to, to do that, I have to have a combination of both. And that's what the Taoists say when we say everything in the universe is a combination of the yin and the yang. The, and they say it in very primitive terms. They don't go into as much depth there or as much, you know, obvious scientific understanding. I mean, that's a scientific understanding of the yin and yang. Another scientific understanding of the yin yang is the the systole and the diastole of the heart. You see, where it goes like that. There's an inward motion and outward motion. That's the that's the yin and the yang. The yin is the yin, 
the yang is the out. Another scientific understanding, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems, which one in which constricts and then the other relaxes, etc. So it's that's also a yin and a yin. Many, 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 you know, you could go into this. But the, the brain anatomy, where you have the audio, uh, uh, the processing of audition, so the processing of audition, for the most part, from the, the let's say I've got my right ear here, the processes are uh, in the brain is going to my left uh, auditory cortex. And same with the, this one, my left, the, the processing for the um, audition in this left ear goes to my right auditory cortex. And we could say for the eyes as well, with uh, this right part of the, the world is processed in the left part of the retina and then of course via the optic chasm they go to the opposite sides at the back now of course there are some processing as well to the the other just the normal sides of the the hemisphere for example in the the right eye the processing will also go to the right hemisphere at the back but nonetheless a lot of it will go to the left as well so there's a lot of kind of non-dualist ideas within that there's also non-dualist ideas within brain anatomy for example with um uh calculation and emotion with the left side of the the brain generally more calculation and and more um uh language and things like that as well whereas the right half of the brain is is slightly more emotion slightly more um creativity as well now don't get me wrong, this is not a black or white split in the brain or anything like that, N nothing like that. But there are certain things that favour a particular mode of being. And that is the yin and the yang, you see. That's So it's all here. And it's the same as well with the brain, with the, the motor function. When I raise my right hand, uh, that's of course happening in my left uh, hemisphere so it's all this is all yin and yang stuff you know it's crossing over um now most people don't understand that most people don't don't get it because they either think they're either very intelligent people and we say oh no that's a load of crap because aren't you being a bit redu reductionistic there uh, or they're not very intelligent people and we say uh okay i'll 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 take your word for it. But nonetheless, there are some people who actually have uh, a good brain and they think, oh, no, actually, um, that that seems about right. Now, I would say uh, that people who are, intelli who are very intelligent and who reject it, there is a kind of good basis for rejecting it. But nonetheless, because all I would say is nonetheless, because of non-dualism being so accurate in the experience of the world and in the uh, in logic, in philosophical logic and all these sorts of things in science, etc. It being such experiential, the fact that you really can't have an inside with an outside or whatever else Alan Watts would say. It, 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 it seems absolutely ridiculous to reject it. It seems like you're rejecting the fundamental principle of life. So then it makes me wonder, well, why is it that people don't reject it? Now, normally, why people don't reject it, as I say, if you say, well, maybe it's too reductionistic. Um, maybe that's the case. But this is the funny thing. Whenever you look into something, physics, waves and particles and all that sort of stuff whenever you look into whatever it is in superficially or in some depth you always come across this kind of idea of yin and yang somewhere always you always come across it and it can be quite blatant and in your face or it can be kind of there with a little bit of added complexity uh, and, but nonetheless, it's there. I mean, it's like the, the sodium and potassium relationship in the a action potential. That's got a kind of yin and yang, well, that is actually yin and yang, uh, and that's the um, kind of ungendered forms of the will and the idea of which then become gendered 
through the subjective con consciousness of humanity as the anima and the animus, you see. And that's the action potential. Um, and, and so there's a will and an idea there that become uh, those versions of in a sense, well, not become those versions, but they are synonymous with those kind of versions in a sense. So, um, uh, and uh, so it seems bizarre for people not to accept it, um, to, to me, to my mind, but nonetheless, they won't accept it and they'll remain uh, rejecting it. But the problem with rejecting it is that you are throwing the baby out with the bathwater in a sense. Because if, let's say, we are to take that this is a fun fundamental principle or state of the universe at conception and, and throughout its manifestation, and, in, and it bleeds into everything that we do and say, then you're throwing everything out. So what have you got? Well, you've not got anything. So then what you do is you're like a, a blind mouse looking for cheese. You, you, you're looking for all this stuff and you're, you, you're looking at the universe in a conceptual, within a conceptual framework that doesn't fit at all what it actually is. And because, let's say, you so fervently reject an idea of the yin and yang or anything like that, then you obscure yourself massively and you don't know where you are. And then you're like, well, I don't know. It seems to me that the yin and yang are kind of like uh, a guiding principle and, and allow you to understand even the most com complex things more easily because you have the knowledge of the fundamental basic principle of the universe. Now, what do we come across when we fervently accept the yin and yang like i'm doing in this video i'm fervent, fervently accepting the idea of the yin and yang then we come across uh over generalization because then what we say is well i say well of course this is this this is that this is your and it all links into this one general conception so then we all have this we, well uh, we have this idea that is an overgeneralization oversimplification of the processes of the processes of the universe or the processes in any particular given field that we can observe slightly but nonetheless we can't observe piercingly and uh, so what is let's say a necessary solution to this the necessary solution is i believe taking the fact that we can see the yin and yang in many, many things in the universe, but not dogmatically attaching ourselves to that. And now this is a very, very Jungian idea because Jung, I don't know who it was, someone came to him one time and uh, they were going to, they wanted to talk to some people, group of people possibly, a lecture or whatever, I don't know, about Jungian psychology and about like these ideas and potentially uh, what they could do and all the rest of it and, and what application they had and all that sort of stuff. And we were going to talk to people about this and then we we're going to come back to Jung and all the rest of it. And uh, Jung said, well, whatever you do, make sure that people know there is no dogma in Jungian psychology. No, nothing's, uh, nothing's concrete. I, I, I don't know what this is i'm merely making a framework that might suit it might not you know he said things like that and um that has to be the way that has to be the way it has to be well we can see these things and they are a present reality for the most part for what we can discern but they have to be treated with a certain care because if they aren't treated with a certain care, um, then we become prone to overgeneralization and all the rest of it. Now, of course, me being me, um, I do like to kind of say, uh, I have a very kind of strong desire to make concrete judgments, to say, no, this is exactly how it is. No, this is exactly how it is, you know. And I do have good merit to say that because I've looked into philosophy enough now 
Kantian philosophy, Chopinian philosophy, Jungian psychology, uh, or lo loads of different things. And I have seen things, I've understood things intellectually and spiritually uh, that I feel very confident in saying, well, yeah, this is this, this is how it is, this is that. But nonetheless, we always have to give uh, our dues to, let's say, even Kantian ideas, you know, with the fact that we don't know. We can never know. We can never scientifically validate anything 100%. It's never going to be the case. Uh, there could always be something that comes along, a new piece of knowledge that invalidates all of our previous findings. There could be something that we find either in the past, when we're maybe looking back historically, or in the future that is going to come along, that means we are totally wrong. So you always have to give respect to that, give are due to that and it also comes into absurdist philosophy as well with the general premise of absurd of general notion of absurdism being that um of course we can't attribute any meaning to life we just don't know so we do have to do our dues and we have to try and temper ourselves and specifically for me i do have to temper myself quite a lot on being dogmatic and saying, well, there we go, done, you know. Because, mark my words, there are things in philosophy, and there are things in psychology that you basically know. You, you, can, you can learn things about philosophy and psychology, secrets and esoteric teaching, where you know, where you know a lot of what the nature of the universe is, where you know what a lot of things are honestly mark my words there are things that you will find out if you go into philosophy and psychology that are exactly that but that's an issue because it makes the mind inflexible it makes it dogmatic and a dogmatic mind is not attuned to the finitudes and the the nature of life and of the Tao. Um, and that's very much a, um, a saying, really, a paraphrase saying from Lao Tzu. And uh, essentially, if you get like that, you're not going to become a holistic person. You're going to become someone who is one-sided, who's attributed all of their kind of ideas and theories and possibilities to this one thing. Um, and so we could say, in a sense, there's the mature philosopher has to be almost sadly aware or solemnly aware of the fact that they can never ever really understand anything. And that's what a mature philosopher has to come to terms with. Because, of course, a young philosopher, all bullish, all, yeah, I'm going to prove the secrets of life, you know, all that. That's not what a mature philosopher does at all. A mature philosopher says, let's try and solve the little problems. Let's take actionable steps to understanding how we can help society. The idea of the, the mystical, magical, infantile, airy-fairy idea of philosophy, of proving the secrets of existence, is fine for a young philosopher, for someone who's 18 to sort of my age, but after that, it has to mature. Now, the only way, of course, you can mature anything like that is by taking it to the extreme. By doing what Alan Watts says, which is whenever you get an idea in your mind, take it to the extreme. Because in taking it to the extreme, you'll come to you'll come to sanity. You'll come to some realization. So, and that's very much been my experience. So you take it to the extreme, and then what do you do? Well, of course, you find out some great secrets. You find out something about enlightenment or awakening or you find out some sort of Taoist thing or you find out some sort of secret Egyptian thing or you find out some sort of mystical magical teaching and 
then what comes from that is an ability to let go, is an ability to say, well, hang on a minute, I don't need these things. That's not what it's about. That's uh, uh, clinging to these things, clinging to these sorts of ideas won't serve society in a way. And, And the Jungian idea of individuation is inextricably linked to societal value. Jung believed firmly that someone who goes into the inner world, who uh, kind of allows uh, their personality to, to develop internally, must bring back into society what they learned. In Buddhism, it's called upaya, which is a... It's got a few different meanings, actually, but the one meaning I know it uh, in... It's kind of a uh, something that you bring back, uh, a piece of knowledge that you bring back from any sort of spiritual journey and you bestow that to the world. Now, traditionally, we may say, well, this was the ideas of, of uh, you know, the interconnected uh, nature of the universe or whatever, or uh, the idea of you being the, the um, universal self and all that, you know, those. But. You see, in the modern age, that doesn't cut it. That's, we all know about that now. Everyone knows that's the case. You know, that doesn't cut it. So what we have to actually do is go back, in a sense, uh, to go forward. We have to go back to go forward. So we have to cement ourselves as an individuality that is aligning with our instinctive truth within us, the things that are natural within us, uh, within the context of allowing uh, spiritual wisdom to come through that and within that spiritual sorry within that instinctive truth that we present to society from our journey uh, is spiritual wisdom now people can do this in all sorts of ways people write books they write novels so for example we could say that there's a lot of spiritual wisdom in things like the hobbit or in things like Lord of the Rings, or Harry Potter, or um, uh, Narnia, things like that, right? Now, obviously, I'm not saying that that is anything to do with the traditional idea of spirituality. Not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to be. But nonetheless, the information and the knowledge of the life experience of, of those writers has allowed them to combine into a fantasy story some elements of, of real spiritual wisdom, whether they're conscious of those that wisdom or not, whether they're unconscious of it. But that is the, the task. Now, of course, most people, well, let's say if you're going to go down the route of individuation, if that's your kind of your fate, shall we say, um, then that is, of course, going to be conscious. But nonetheless, some people might do it consciously in through the medium of music or through the medium of, of uh, dance or through the medium of non-fiction. Uh, Other people will do it quite consciously through the medium of philosophy, through the medium of psychology, whatever. Jung and people like Alfred Adler... Uh, people like, I suppose you could say, Freud in this, people like maybe Viktor Frankl, uh, people like Piaget, all these pe- people like live today, like Jordan Peterson or Zezik. These types of people have done it through psychology, philosophy, more consciously, more there. Um, and then, of course, you have other people who do it very, very consciously and far, far on one side. Um which would be like the rascal gurus or the spiritual gurus like that. Um, But nonetheless, there has to be an element of individuality that you bring back to the world. Now, on the far side of that, on the side of the rascal gurus and the spiritual gurus, they, ironically enough, at least I would argue, this is merely more of an observation, an experiential observation, is that they have got more of a collectivity and less of an individuality. So they're more playing what we would call in Jungian psychology the trickster archetype. 
the divine trickster archetype whereas um obviously other people who do it more philosophically or psychologically end up cultivating more of an individuality and that would be more in line with individuation um or natural individuation which is the unconscious version of it um so yeah there's all these different ways to do it but ultimately that's um what has to come forth and what has to be brought back from the unconscious because if that isn't brought back if that upayo isn't brought back if that kind of knowledge that sort of in the realm of that bodhisattva um bodhi awakened sattva being awakened being uh if that isn't kind of kind of brought forward i suppose in that way then we actually get someone who um has in a way become a pure eternus in a way um not necessarily in the idea particularly of the complexes surrounding that oedipus complex and things like that not so much on that side of it but in the general sense of that they've clung cling they've been clinging too much to one side of this inner journey of this spiritual knowledge of this magical mystical element and they've not brought something through to the world and that and the process of first before being spiritual to then gaining some spiritual knowledge to then being a mature spiritual individual in the world the process is uh coming to terms with all this and being able to align it through your individuality and and do it in your way that is the post that is really in a sense that is individuation in in a couple of sentences um and and that's what is the task for all of us but as i mentioned it's very very hard and and it's incredibly incredibly like that now for me personally it's incredibly hard because i have all of these eccentric tendencies within me that aren't fully integrated yet so you know i i uh, like for example in the personality say the type of experience let's say i mean now within my personality this isn't the whole whole of who i am because of course i have these eccentric tendencies well yeah, 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 you know all this so you see however whole i may feel right now in this moment i'm not a whole individual because i'm not in this moment integrated those eccentric tendencies you see so there's still more work to be done now i can't even conceive in my own individuation how the hell cuz i'm a bloody expensive expensive i'm a bloody expansive guy I don't see how the entirety of my expanse of my personality can all fit into one particular experience of of conversation shall we say like right now um because at the moment yes I'm more in the philosophical end I've not fully integrated this eccentricity that, that would be more present in in a feeling dimension within my speech right now um certainly there's the presence right now of a little bit more feeling and the balance between think- thinking and feeling function at the moment is not like in this conversation it's not too bad yeah it's not too bad it's quite good actually it's quite in the middle it's quite centered there's good bit of thinking but there's also a good bit of feeling so it's not too bad um compared to within the past but nonetheless the eccentricity that resides in the feeling isn't there you see quite yet so trying to get these things coagulated into some sort of whole is a very very hard journey now of course for me i'm um too hard on myself because they say well that's idiotic adam that's ridiculous because you're more philosophical now that's how you are now and you're an integrated personality in this moment but then in 10 minutes you might be eccentric uh, but in the eccentric side you're an integrated personality maybe but um i mentioned at the start of the video i believe the bind i'm currently in and this is the bind i'm currently in 
this introduction of my personality perception called ads, which is my eccentricity, through my personality as balanced and harmonized with all of the other six personality perceptions in a whole structured personality called Adam, where I can be balanced in my thinking and feeling function, probably a little bit less so on my sensation function, because obviously I'm an intuitive type anyway. Um, God, like, <laughs> I don't think anyone would ever dispute the fact I'm an intuitive type. Jesus, man, this video. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, but, uh, so, you see, that's, so, it, that's a task. That's a task. But nonetheless, I think the unconscious with the formulation over time of, of multiple transcendent functions will allow me that, will allow me that kind of access to a um, more of a, a bringing in. And I, I do believe that it'll be ads that allows me more of a, a holistic relationship with my anima that isn't fully there, you know. It's There's hints of it, you know, coming through. There's hints, there's nice little bits of it coming through, but it's not fully there yet. No, no, no. So, um, no, so it'll be a nice journey to, to go through this meditation stage four fully and um, see if I can't get a little bit more wholeness within the full expression of my personality. But nonetheless, it's been a long four years and... Um, we can merely just ruminate on how much longer it's going to take and and, and to what end it, it's going to be, you know. So um, I'm going to leave it there because we've been an hour. Thank you very much for listening to this video. Uh, or, well, watching this video. It's not a podcast, is it? And uh, so, yeah, there we go. So thank you very much for watching, guys. And uh, I will see you very soon. So see you very soon, guys. Mm -hmm.